we actually got in touch with the little girl and we're asking them, hey, can you go to this website? What is my IP address.com? Can you walk me through the process for the listeners who are, you know, sort of the technical guys? You started with the IP and what, what, what happens next? How do you get to a location? Data mining. They will just go and they'll just pick you up. Welcome to the Hackers Empire podcast. I'm your host, Nilesh, and our guest in today's episode is Larry Cameron, the CISO of the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative. Basically, what he does is use his hacking skills to help in preventing human trafficking. Larry is a real-life superhero, and his superpower is actually his OSINT skills. Let's hear it from Larry himself, how he used his hacking skills to hack human traffickers and save thousands of lives. Cool. So I know, yeah, I know you're a busy man. So I'm going to start uh, right off the bat. You know, we will have time for our small talk. Yeah, you know, we will stay connected on LinkedIn, but I'm going to start right off the bat. Human trafficking, we know how serious it is, right? But can you tell me a story or um, let's say a case that you have been working on, which really captures the depth of the issue, even for you, I mean, you have been doing it from quite some time, but even for you, it was quite shocking, you know, something that something like this that was happening in uh, plain sight. Uh, I was working one day and I received a report from a person uh, came in through email. And uh, it was talking about this issue in Myanmar. So I was looking through the issue, and uh, I never heard of it before. It was called pig butchering. So pig butchering, it's kind of like the old investment scam, romance scams. But it kind of evolved that the people who are the scammers, they're actually being trafficked. There's many different things. There's uh, labor trafficking. uh, There's sex trafficking. And uh, they're of no use to them. There's actually organ trafficking. So they sell them in between these compounds. Uh, You know, and I was researching into the issue further, and I found out that, well, the prime minister of Cambodia was lining his pockets with all this money. So that's why nothing was getting done. So the only thing that could actually make things happen was the international community, you know, looking upon Cambodia and telling them like they're condemning it. Yeah. Like what, what are you doing? Right. So finally, yeah, there was uh 10,000 raids. They say, uh, a lot of them got shut down. A lot of them moved. Uh, apparently some stats say there was about a hundred thousand people that were trafficked through Cambodia during, uh, I think it was a two or three year period. hundred fucking thousand. Yeah. Damn. It's quite a bit. And it, oh, it, it totally gets worse. Uh, but I moved to Myanmar and they had a $15 billion compound. It's called KK Park. It's one of the worst ones. But uh, they show some videos of them tasing them with the little cattle prods and people screaming. There's videos of them getting beaten, the bruises on them. Uh, they're getting tortured. So it shows kind of the breadth of the issue and that it's not a small scale. It's global issue. So uh, why do they torture them? To uh, like keep them within the compound? To make them comply. Yeah, they want them to comply. They want them to run these cryptocurrency scams. They say, you know, upwards of $10 billion, two to three years. So it's not, it's not pocket change. They're making a lot of money yeah. off this. Uh, if they don't scam, then that's when they get tortured. So, and uh, the women, if they don't want to scam, they go over to the the karaoke bar where they get sex trafficked and raped by military and the people who do good over at the compounds and uh, tourists. So it's like a prize for doing good within the compound. Since you mentioned it, you think usually law enforcement or some politician or someone is involved. That's why these uh, operations thrive, right? Mostly. Well, they're in uh, this one's in Myanmar. They're special economic zones, so they're essentially lawless. 
you have the Myanmar military who are actually protecting the compounds. So they get around 30% of the profits, they say. 30%. Just so they can protect them. And 30% of billions is, well, still billions. Yeah. Right? That's why, that's why you say follow the money, right? If you follow the money, you're going to... Follow the money. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. There was uh, the Department of Justice they seized, I think it was $112 million from one of these uh, scam compounds in one wallet, I think. There's a lot of money. Going it's quite a bit of money. Yeah. There's a lot of money going around. I mean, most businesses, even like, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, even they... Even for them, it's a lot of money. And that's why it's been happening. It's, it's all yeah. about the money, right? All comes down to the money. And uh, Exactly. Okay. Well, so how these guys, how these traffickers are, um, you know, there has to be some ideal target for them, you know, let's say vulnerable victims. What kind of things they look uh, for, let's say, they are, uh, you know, gathering information about me. If this person can be trafficked or not, what, what is it about? What is it about the environment or yeah. you know, the background? They're looking for people that are vulnerable. So people that, uh, you know, during COVID, nobody had a job. Yeah. Really, most of the jobs were shut down. You know, people were hungry. People needed to support their families. So they're looking for these vulnerabilities that people are desperate for money so that they offer them a high wage, but they'll fly them to Cambodia or Myanmar or Laos, you know, or Thailand, and they bring them across the border. So once you're vulnerable, you're desperately looking for mm. work and you will take a high paying job, obviously. So, so they're look, it's the perfect. looking for people who need the money. Yeah. Yeah, which is everybody. Everybody wants money to survive, yeah, but right? That's on the recruitment side of the things. Let's say a human trafficker recruiting um, candidates for their operation. How about on the victim side of the things? Let's say, what what do they look in a victim? You know, uh, people have, let's say, they are trafficking uh, minors or women for sex trafficking. There has to be something they look for, right? Yeah, there are some minors that have been popping up. There's a small amount of Americans or British or Australians that are popping up. They like the accents, I guess. They have a new scam targeting Australians. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, they will just go and they'll just pick you up. Pick you up, like abduct. And there's a lot of neighboring countries. I think there's around 40 countries or 40 to 60 that they're targeting that's actually bringing them there. Oh, so they just abduct you from yeah. schools and from... They'll try to uh, lure you. How though? Like, yeah, they, they must have been using websites like uh, Omegle or... Uh, no? Facebook, Instagram, Social media. Twitter, Snapchat. Like, you can go into... Facebook probably now and type in Myanmar casino job. Boom. There's going to be like tons of groups. There's going to be tons of ads. Not one of them are real because the casinos are in the special economic zones. They used to be illegal in Myanmar, but since the military overthrown the government because of these compounds, they shut them down in power. A week later, they turned the power back on. Uh -huh. And then they kept on trying to condemn these uh, pig butchering compounds or financial grooming. Uh, see, a pig butchering, it's kind of like an ignorant term. So you kind of want to use the proper terms, kind of like, you know, the child porn, you want to use child sexual abuse mm. material uh, because it's degrading to the victims. But these compounds, I mean, there's lawless the government overthrown the the or the government was overthrown by the military so who's leading a bunch of corrupt individuals yeah and they have no morals i mean by the numbers no. yeah by the numbers None. that you told 100 100,000 in in 2 years i mean that clearly um, 
tells me they have yeah, two to three years. a lot of money flowing around. Might be almost four now. But uh, yeah, it's quite a high number. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been seeing thousands rescued here, thousands rescued here. You know, so common. I found like hundreds of articles when I started mm -hmm. digging. It's suppressed. Unless you're looking for it, you're not going to find it. It's they're hiding in the plain sight. I have a question. I mean, since you mentioned all these numbers and you are dealing with on a day to day basis. What about your mental state, man? Like, does these things affect you in any way to like, you know, function properly in day to day because you're seeing all these horrifying things? You know, let's say if you watch a horror movie, you will be scared for the rest of the night, right? But you are witnessing all these cases, these horrifying acts. Does that affect your mental state? That's just one case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it takes a lot. You know, sometimes you create these little things that help you deal with the situation. But, you know, usually it's past trauma that allows you to overcome this. Like you say, well, I've been through a lot worse. It's not happening to me. You know, I go to bed, I wake up, it's another day. It's... Some people only last one to two to three years. They're off to a new job or they take a break. You know, there's too much work to be done in order to take these breaks sometimes. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't have weekends sometimes. I don't have time for myself sometimes just because there's more and more and more stuff coming at me. I mean, last night... I was up know, 3, 4 a.m., but it's because a friend reached out to me, uh, one that I helped in the past and that we worked together, and they're like, yeah, my sister's, uh, what was it, her, hmm. her cousin or something, uh, her cousin's sister, who's 12, 13 years old, was taken to Mexico. Uh, she's being held at gunpoint. She's being beaten and raped, like, daily. So that, you know, they want $1,000. And they're not going to bring them past the border unless they pay this $1,000. Like a, like a ransom, right? It's a ransom. So I'm up. I'm working on leads, you know. We actually got in touch with the little girl and we're asking them, hey, can you go to this website? What is my IP address.com? Okay, so I got the website so, or the IP address. So I can then do run it through different systems to find different information, find devices, find location data, find leaky applications that provide me with more mm -hmm. intel. So, you know, I've got this place geolocated. And then I'm saying, well, She's here. I know some people that can, you know, maybe go and uh, do an extraction. They're like, well, she's scared to go outside. I'm like, why? Well, the cartel's there. Mm. Like, she's scared to, you know, she's in a situation where she's being raped and beaten, but she doesn't want to go to another situation where she gets raped and beaten. She doesn't trust law enforcement because I don't know what happened. But there's a story behind that. I mean, these are the situations we deal with daily. So how accurate was the location that you found out? One meter. Because it's the GPS yeah. coordinates from the device. So we have to mine this location data, you know, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, Snapchat. Snapchat, there's actually a map you can view live all the kids yeah. in your city. I did a post on that one time. How to enable ghost mode. On Snapchat. Uh, you know, they, yeah, they just make you vulnerable, these applications. They make you a target. You know, it's a, it's like a shopping ground for grooming. Mm. And people always share where they are, what they are doing on social media, right? And it's... Uh, now, now you guys know how... Uh, I cannot find the right word, but how dangerous it can be to share info, to share information about your whereabouts on social media. Damn. So you started, yeah, you started yeah. with the IP, right? 
Can you walk me through the process for the listeners who are, you know, sort of the technical guys? You started with the IP, and what what, what happens next? How do you get to a location? Data mining. It's a, it's a secret part of, of my job, but we data mine for location intelligence. So we pick GPS coordinates, we create a geofence, and then once we execute that and start mining and searching for location info, you know, sometimes we can even get uh, speed or elevation or different things, but the elevation used to help me in a hotel room oh. stuff. Uh, so which floor they're on, I'd have to get a, a reading on the ground and then I'd have to get uh, the reading in the room and I'd be able to get that. Uh, the speed would help me kind of filter out people that are walking, running, driving, biking. So you can tell by the speed, you know, kind of what they're doing. You know, if it's like zero or 0 0.1, then chances are they're just like they're hanging out, around. right? I have. Well, 0 0.1 kilometers per hour, it's like, you know, when you get a reading in like 15 minutes. So you have to you have to look at the data and you have to analyze it a lot and you have to do behavior and, and pattern analysis. It's complex, but it works. Data mining. It's pretty accurate. Yeah, so how do you get the data? Of course, you have tools and everything. You work with the law enforcement, but you where do you get the data from? Uh, social media? Law enforcement can't use these methods. They cannot? So you... You are no, a contractor. These are secret. You are a contractor for the law enforcement. Is is that correct? Correct me if, if I'm wrong. Nope. How does that no, work? Man. How do you work with law I, enforcement? I just volunteer them data. I don't work well. Law enforcement will come to me with cases, or we sometimes take cases from the public. But you know, law enforcement's coming to me for this. You know, they don't have the tools. They don't have the budget. They don't have the training to do this, let alone every single local, state, or federal law enforcement agency. Plus, then there's privacy issues and constitution issues yeah. and a bunch of stuff you have to deal with. See, I don't have to deal with those things. And so I don't care about for... privacy. If you can have yeah. it, I'm going to use whatever is in my means that's ethical without, you know, uh, actively red teaming or hacking a company, I think it's, I, I can do whatever that is. As long as yeah. I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not. Yeah, of course. Like it's public information, OSINT. So you are gathering data from public resources, public sources, and you are analyzing a them and a lot. And you are able to figure out speed elevation location stuff like this oh and yeah i'm fascinated different metrics different metrics how does this metric help you yeah. yeah how how does this metric help in let's say an extraction can you share a story or something you know that helped when this information helped a law enforcement or um, <coughs> you know, someone who was doing a doing an extraction to get the victims out of the place you know yeah, I mean, I mean, there's hundreds of these different situations. I mean, one of them, it was in New York. Uh, we were trying to find this girl. We got all this, uh, they got a subpoena from Instagram, but they're looking at the subpoena data. They don't know what to make of it. So I analyze that data from Instagram. The It's kind of like a dump of their account. Uh, when you submit a warrant or subpoena or production order, you get all this data back. We got to look at this data, say, well, they go to this IP address in the past week 38 times. Okay, that they check in from this IP address. So they check in one of them here. Uh, it's only one, so let's ignore that. Uh, there's a few here. Uh, there's five from here, but oh, it's a cellular network. Could be anything. If it's an IPv4 address, chances are it's NAT, network address translation. So people could be sharing that IP. So unless we know a destination or a whole bunch of other data regarding that, we can't narrow it down. 
But if it's an IPv6, yeah, we can. But if it's an ISP network, then okay. What date time is that? Okay, well, there's a subscriber tied to that. But before we subpoena the ISP on this, let's see if we can data mine. So we do data mining. We found, okay, so 38 of these, of the 38, they are in this location. Okay, so this location is an apartment building. Okay, so let's look at the GPS coordinates more. Okay, they're on this side of the apartment building. We may or may not be able to get height. It's, it's difficult. But, you know, why don't you send some uh, a patrol mm -hmm. car down there? look for information or something oh look there's that lady coming out of the or the the missing kid coming out of the apartment building okay so we we don't need a warrant in order to go in there and boot it down we don't need a subpoena the isp let's just go put them in cuffs and rescue the kid so you have to yeah the behavior and pattern analysis or pattern of life you know, you have to, you know, what makes sense with this mm. data? What's happening? A lot of data correlation. Yeah. It's like a puzzle. So essentially yeah. you have made the process faster because they didn't have to subpoena the ISP. They didn't have to get a warrant to search the place to find the victim. And where you come in is actually speeding up the process by analyzing all this data. It's the process, the context of the data and knowing, you know, how it works and Got why it. and how Got and where and when, who, what, where, when, why, how. There was one thing I wanted to talk about. I was talking to a common friend of you and me and uh, she was uh, telling me about something that was really shocking for me. There is there is a flavor of... Uh, trafficking when they traffic all these women and something there's something called a forced birth can you can you touch base on that unfortunately larry's response to my question didn't get recorded but to sum it all up larry was talking about these uh, poor countries where the government is not able to provide basic opportunities and necessities to their citizens and these people get involved in something called forced birth where they sell their babies and their full-time job is to have babies and sell them for various different reasons now i cannot go into the different reasons these babies are being sold and purchased but this conversation led to some conspiracy theories and we started talking about cults people who get involved in sacrificial stuff and then this conversation is going to continue from there. Sometimes there's a displacement, there's war, there's, but I mean, the people that purchase them, I mean, they, they could be doing it for many different things. Uh, you know, some people think cults are a conspiracy theory, but I'm here to tell you they actually exist. Um, you know, the Mayans uh, as well, sacrificial stuff. You know, some people still believe in this stuff. And, you know, I, I can think of this like uh, geoengineering. So you ever, you ever hear of uh, the crop spraying or the, like the, the yeah, airplanes? Yeah. Uh, weather modification? Okay, I remember when this was all going around and it was a big conspiracy theory. But, you know, if you actually do OSINT and you look for information, you would figure out that, oh, there's 37 patents filed on this a decade ago, okay? So if there's 37 patents on weather modification, do you, do you think this is really a thing or is it a conspiracy theory? You know, this stuff's real and people need to know how to look for this information so they can make an informed decision, you know? Um, you know, and now, I mean, they do it for events like the Olympics. Uh, they want it to be sunny one day. You know, let's just do some weather modification. You know, everyone thinks this is just a conspiracy theory anyway. Yeah, and I was, I was uh, 
listening to the Joe Rogan podcast and he was mentioning about these uh, Arabs <laughs> that have a lot of money. They make it rain. I mean, if you have the money, you can make it rain every week. They make it rain every week. And uh, it's not, yeah, it's not a conspiracy yeah. theory. I do understand now. You got to ask questions. If you ask the right questions, you're going to find the right answers. Hmm. Yeah. I don't even know where to look to find where the to answers. Look. Cool, yeah. Larry. OSINT. Coming back to OSINT, um, let's say I don't know anything about OSINT. How would I start? How would I become better at OSINT? That's the whole thing about OSINT. You OSINT to be better at OSINT. Learn how to Google, learn how to Google dork. If you have a question, you know, what part of those things can get you the answer? It's usually taking keywords from anything you're involved in, typing in those keywords. Don't even type in a full sentence. Just type in keywords. And you'll have the most relevant, based on those keywords, that's out there by just using Google. If you have a question, ask Google. And you don't even know. Type in the keyword. Yeah, like OSINT better training. Better OSINT training. You know, you want to become better at open source intelligence, so you need training. So put in those three keywords, boop, just pops right up. What is this? Use the quotation <laughs> stuff to say, no, it has to have this. I mean, that's how you get better as OSINT. You, go in OSINT. Got it. What's this? People think it's, you need to be told how to OSINT, but no, you need to tell Google what you want to find. It's easier. People, people like to complicate stuff, but OSINT is the easiest because it's out there and all you need is the keywords to narrow stuff down. And then you check it back and you just keep on going deeper and deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole. Got it. What's this fascination in uh, people about going into the dark web and uh, finding information from the dark web? I mean, um, I have tried it, uh, but to me, it's all just uh, a bunch of dead links and stuff like that. What's this fascination about the dark web? In, in theory, in, in, in technical terms, it's just the sites that are not getting indexed. But these YouTubers and uh, these people, they are making it sound like, you know, there is something hidden at the dark web that you need to find out or the deep web. Well, no, it's, a, it's for, like, you can go directly to a regular site from the dark web. It doesn't have to be a dark web site. I mean, the dark web sites, you know, a lot of them are dead because... Any V2 links, those were decommissioned last October. So if they're, it's very short, it's not going to work. If it's longer, it might work. So that's a V3 onion address. So the V3 onion address, you need to have a valid address to go to it. But if it gets shut down, then whatever, it's not going to be there. So you have to know the site. I know about 100,000 valid sites on the dark web. Because why we index them. How, how did you... Okay? People say the dark web is an index, but you can index it yourself, yeah. right? Just be your own Google. Yeah. I mean, what people say, you, you don't always need to believe. Uh, but it, it's very difficult to find a valid site because, you know, it's just a bunch of garbage out there. For a million sites, there's probably only like, you know, a few thousand. How much time did it take? <laughs> it's just... How much time did it take you yeah, to so, index? I mean, uh, you just find all these links, you find directories, you dump them, and we have about 250,000 links from the dark web that we found, like dark web URLs. And, uh, you know, not as many of them are up. So it's just, you can avoid censorship. Like, for instance, China. If you're in China, they're going to censor what you see. They're going to, you know, if something's going on in the world, they'll show you something else. That's because you're in China and they control what people see on the Internet. Okay. But you can connect to Tor and see what they're saying about the topic on the Internet. 
you know, in other areas of the world. You go out random exit nodes. It's not rocket science, but it's hard to find a site on the dark web that's up. All right. Thanks, Larry. I have taken enough of your time. You can, um, I think we can wrap up the call. I don't have anything else, but uh, if you have something for me, then uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, go to linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Larry Cameron 80. And if you like the podcast, leave Nilesh a recommendation. Or if you liked my speech or my talk, you can leave me a recommendation. Read through them. I collect those as well. <laughs> you, you collect coins and you collect recommendations. And I will put your uh, yeah patches. Patches. Certifications. You have like 400 of them. Damn, that's a lot of number. That certificates. I have 66 certifications. They're different. One has an S and one's a certification. They're different. <laughs> With certifications, you get designations. You get to put the letters past your name. With certificates, they're just like one in a million. Rare. Yeah. <laughs> Got it, man. I'm going to put everything in the description. I, I'm And I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be reaching out to you after this uh, podcast. I'm going to market the hell out of this one. And uh, thanks for the conversation. It was amazing. And I learned a lot from you. And I'll, I'll keep in touch. Sounds okay. good. Cool. Talk to you soon. I'm sorry. You needed to function in the mornings. Yeah, of course. Even uh, I, I don't drink coffee, but I use green tea that um, clears up my throat. Cool. So How's this? now this is yeah, this is fine. So you are in the frame, looking looking nice. Yeah, clean my <laughs> eyes. Yeah. Clean my glasses. Wow. <laughs> This will be a good one uh, for, for behind the like scenes. Half an hour earlier. <laughs> this will be a good one for uh, behind the scenes. Right. How's that? Perfect. Perfect, is yeah. it? So. This is your 100th podcast. This is my 100th. This is my second podcast. So. Yeah, I know. It, it, it feels like your 100th. It's a natural flow. So keep it natural. Don't script it, but go over what you'll be discussing. Kind of gives people time to get a feel for it and uh, be aware of what you'll be speaking on so you can think of these situations. Because when you think on the fly, you don't always get the best scenario.